Welcome to another issue of Dr. James Beckett Sports Card Insights. Thank our sponsors, Beckett Media, BGS, BAS, and all the other Beckett entities. I'm no longer the boss. I'm just a friend of the company, and they're a, they're a sponsor. Also, we have Burbank Sports Cards with Rob Barris being a sponsor, ComC, uh, with, uh, led by Tim Getch, Heritage Auctions, led by Chris Ivey, Huggins and Scott Auctions, I deal with Bill Huggins. Mike Stadium Sports Cards, which is Mike Fruitman, and then Panini, Tops, and Upper Deck with uh, those strong teams and excellent card companies. Today, we're doing something a little bit different. As you notice, I've had a, a frequent guest, Rich Klein. Hi, glad to be back. And this time, we're going to turn the tables, and instead of me interviewing Rich or having a conversation, as Rich would say, I'm going to kind of give the first chair microphone to Rich and let him interview me for a little while and see see what uh, develops. It's unrehearsed, but uh, Rich and I have been friends for a long time. We've worked together and uh, looking forward to see what, what pops up. So welcome, Rich, and Thanks take it away. Me. You know, we had somebody come over to our house yesterday, and I was explaining about you actually developed the whole concept of the price guide, not based necessarily on the basic tops or bowmans, but by spreading out and doing a broad-based knowledge and explaining that what really got everything going was the fact that you could talk about more than basic tops and bowmans, that you could talk about dandies, and you could talk about New York Journal Americans, and you could talk about T206s and 5s and 7s and E121s. And when you did your price guide, those, those items and more were all included. My question is, when you were dealing in the early 70s, when it was really more of the wild, wild west, and collecting in the early and mid-70s, what fascinated you about wanting to get more information on the, we'll call it the, the stranger material, the oddball material, than digging in more to the basic stuff where it was easier to establish a market and buy and sell those cards? Well, my first, uh, before I even got involved in the organized hobby, I and I've mentioned this in an earlier episode, I... I got my dad's cards at Christmas of 1959, which were a, a couple of small boxes of Gowdies and play balls and some other stuff in there, but mainly those mainstream issues. And so it made me realize that cards have been around a long time and, and cards could be of interest uh, regardless. And then when I met Gervis Ford, the first uh, person in the organized hobby that I met, and again in the late 60s, he acquainted me with the facts that there the fact that there was more than just tops and bowmans. So I always I always knew that some of that other stuff was harder to find. And so when the first price guides came out, you have to go before that. In nineteen seventy six I announced the first really formal price survey. And on that survey were some of those issues that you mentioned because that was where it really was the Wild Wild West. Tops and Bowmans and some of the other mainstream sets you could you could kind of pick up what went for what, but the more obscure, the more scarce, more rare items, that's where uh, there, were, there was a real mismatch. Those who had the knowledge uh, didn't, uh, most did, mostly did not share it, and so they would buy from you at a low price, but they, and they wouldn't sell, uh, or if they did sell, it was for a, a, a much higher price because the, there were a few dealers that really understood the scarcity. And I, I, it's not that I wanted to expose anything. I just wanted to create a level playing field. And so from the very first survey, those more obscure issues were, 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 were called out for, uh, you know, what they're selling for and published for free. Did you enjoy collecting the oddball cards or the, or trying to finish your basic, you were telling the story earlier about the 66 and seven high numbers that finished your sets. What did you enjoy collecting more? Well, I've always enjoyed, I mean, now I, I, I'm probably more of a type card collector. I, I like seeing unusual things. One of the things we shared is going to the Nationals and other shows and trying to pick up things that would uh, expand the knowledge of, of cards that hadn't been discovered or that we hadn't seen, get an idea of not just what the value was, but just the fact that they even existed and be able to help people to know uh, what they had and what it'd be worth. But yeah, I, I like the, the more obscure stuff, especially obscure stuff of players that, that I like or players that I think are popular. If it's an obscure set, you don't know any of the players. I don't know where the connection is, but 
And that's true of all sports, not just baseball. Right, but I know baseball is the one I know the most about. You know, I'm okay on some of the other Me too, sports. me too. But, I mean, I, I've, I've done a lot with the basketball and football and hockey. I, I mean, our price guides were intended to be uh, uh, as comprehensive as possible. Oh, I did quite a bit with those two. Exactly. I, I came up with some items that people would look years later. I never should have sold you that. Well, I appreciate the fact you sold it to me when you did. Well, especially because in the interim decades, we've never seen another one. Right. You know, <coughs> and I'm going to, you know, this is one of the stories, and I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell a story about you about 25, 27 years ago. We were at a show in White Plains, New York, and a dealer has the unopened box of 1961 Pittsburgh Pirate Tagons. And it was a cool sect. And you reacted like you were 10 years old when you saw it. It had your favorite players in it from yeah. your childhood. And you were like, oh, this is cool. This is my childhood coming back. Yep. I think I'm happier seeing that than, <laughs> than making more money from selling another 100,000 price guides. Well, if something is another, if it's obscure and it's not commonly seen, I think that's, that's, that's interesting. By the, by the time you get to that point, Rich, I, I'd been through an awful lot of cards. I've been to all the nationals. I've been to a thousand oh. card shops. I've been to, uh, I'm sure a thousand shows. So you don't want to, and it's always been fresh to me. It's not like, well, I've seen it all. No. And you know this too, because you've been to probably as many shows or more and, and stores or more. It, it, when you see something you haven't seen or that, or that you, is not commonly seen, it's, it's, it's fun. Isn't it exciting in a way? I've never seen this before. Tell the me. The treasure hunt. It's yeah. a treasure hunt. And so, but you know, when you were doing the treasure hunt, you were also doing the basic tops and Bowmans, and it yes. took a long time before you hired anybody else to help you with pricing. You did all the pricing for the first 10 years by yourself before you hired BA. You had, you know, you would send out surveys, but for the most part, you did all the pricing yourself. Now, did you ever say to yourself when I'm doing the pricing, this would be so much easier if I had all these people helping me? Or did you always say, I'm the only one who could do this and let me just... Think? No, I didn't think I was the only one that could do it, but it's just I really enjoyed doing it. And when the company was smaller and the number of sets was so much smaller and had a lot of contributors and input people that I, that I came to really trust. So it wasn't, uh, it wasn't just information that was coming in that was disconnected from the source but so many fewer cards, and condition wasn't as big a deal in those days, and uh, it was it was uh, it was enjoyable. But what what happened? What tipped the scales was probably eighty nine, when even though I'd been doing price guide books annually in these other sports, once the magazines were, once football was spun off as a separate magazine with monthly deadlines. Now, I mean, I, I realized in conversations with people close to me, they said, well, you're, you're going to kill yourself if you, if you have these other separate magazines. I said, no, that will force me to delegate because instead of having a deadline once a month, I'm going to have with, with, I had envisioned for it, wound up being more than that, but baseball, basketball, football, hockey, that would be the four weeks of the, of the month. And I'd have a deadline every Monday or Tuesday, whatever the deadline day was. And so that will force me to, to delegate, and that's really when things took off. Okay, so we were, we've talked about the national quite a bit. Yes. But other than the national, you know, if there was no national, what would be your favorite location to go to on a show and store trip? Well, back in the day, I went to all the, the, the major right, populations. But, but out of all those major populations, what was your favorite place to go to? Uh, I originally really got a kick out of anything in Canada, especially Toronto, because it was a cram course in hockey and some Canadian baseball stuff. So that was very, very helpful in the early years of that show. But before that, going into the, into New York and New Jersey, where you grew up, there was such population density, such great regionals and so many cards there. That was a real treat too. Going to Southern California or, or uh, Northern California, uh, all of them were better than Texas at the time. And, you know, in the early years, I was at Bowling Green State University as a professor. So I had I had uh, time and, and wheels to and I was single in those days so I could make, you know, Chicago had some great shows, um, Detroit, Cincinnati, Cleveland. Uh, it, it, I, I basically spent most of those years going at least once a month to a major show. Well, I'd almost see you in New York once a month back in the day. Well, that was a long time ago, but yeah, I mean, it was, it was, uh, I mean, New York was, was, uh, was pr some of my favorite show experiences were in New York because it, uh, prices were higher, 
uh, there, I, in, in the, what I sense. But on the other hand, the, the quality and quantity of the stuff was just The amazing. other thing is, you get, frankly, a lot of times you'll get a more honest opinion from the people. They'll, they'll tell you very quickly, we think you're wrong, and here's why. Absolutely, yeah, and which uh, it, it cuts, cuts out a lot of the fluff. So when you see where people are coming from, and they, they meant well, I mean well, but uh, you want to be on the same page and you want to have commu- communication is not successful unless it's received and understood in the way it was intended. Is there any item you've never seen but you've heard about that you would have said, that I really wanted to own? I'm not sure about that, Rich. I mean, I think uh, I had a want list uh, probably up through the 70s, at which point it just wasn't practical to be able to list cards or numbers of things that you're looking for. And uh, so now when I see something that's interesting and unusual, and I probably, I mean, I'm not poor. I'm I'm sure considered wealthy, but still I don't want to spend huge bucks on something. Uh, un, you know, if, if it's the equivalent of buying something that's more material, if it's hundreds of dollars, that's, that's, uh, not as big a deal, but there, there are now cards that are thousands and tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands. And I'm not, that's, I don't think, I don't get that level of enjoyment, uh, other than, uh, other than seeing it, whether, whether it's a bargain or not. So I've, I've, I've bid on Wagner's and Lajue's before and been an underbidder at a price that I thought was a, was a, was a reasonable price at the time. And I got outbid. Now it looks like I was, Stupid. <laughs> I don't think you were stupid. You, you, you never bid anything more than what you are comfortable with at any time. And I, I think there's nothing wrong with that. I think you were always, I call it aggressive yet con- conservative yet aggressive. Okay. Conservative in terms of, you know, let's watch what we're doing, but aggressive in terms of, hey, look, we're doing this. Let's do it. Let's do it all the way. If, well, we were on a mission. Yes. We were on a mission. But, uh, and even now, now that I'm not there, the, the price guides do, kind of draw the line and you know Brian and his predecessors and and all the people that are at Beckett Media working on price guides when something gets so so scarce it's they've deemed it maybe not impossible but not perhaps not helpful to list a price for a one of one it, it either is available or it's not and it's in the eye of the beholder and I I don't fault them for that I'd love to put a price on everything but it's if you're trying to make it as much as possible empirically based and data based you know, when there's no transactions, it's it's not that you're making up a price as much as you're trying to figure out what it would sell for, again, based on data that you do have. It's filling in a piece of the puzzle. You know, one 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 rule you always gave that I always treat, treated that I thought was really cool. If an item's we needed it was under twenty dollars, just buy it. If it's between twenty and fifty, probably buy it if you're reasonably sure. If it's over fifty, you better darn well be sure it's a really good buy if we need it. Well, I always like that. Uh, I always like that rule. That was well, always- that's a reasonable rule. But the the challenge was, if you and I were at the same show and we're heading off in different directions, we uh, not often, but sometimes we'd both come back with the same interesting thing that we both that, maybe got from the same table. But but uh, that rarely happened. That, that was the amazing. That was the amazing thing. It yeah. hardly ever happened. You and I could go over all these years, over yeah. all these years, and maybe we conflict on one or two items out of a hundred at any show. Jim, thanks for your time. We'll do some more of these chats later. Rich, thanks for drawing out some uh, some great memories. This is a, a, a wonderful hobby. I mean, we're actually talking about the hobby aspect of it. We we also have some industry and and uh, business experience. We'll we'll deal with that at another time. But thanks for taking me back down memory lane to remember some of the uh, uh, the foundations of of uh, how how we got started and why we love this this hobby so much. So thanks, Rich. Thanks, Jim. We'll do it again.